My name is Delvin Varghese, and I'm a research fellow at Action Lab, a group that conducts real-world research with communities, NGOs, and government bodies, and is based at Monash University. Today, I'll be talking about participatory video, also known as PV. PV is an established practice within nonprofits in the international development space. They use it to gather community feedback on development projects through the use of community-created content. Back in 1967, Lowe and Snowden pioneered the FOGO process, in which they put filmmaking equipment directly in the hands of children. And these children then capture the challenges of living on Fogo Island in the province of Newfoundland, Canada. Since then, a number of organizations, and NGOs in particular, have been seeing the potential of using PV to enable communities they work with to tell their stories. This enables NGOs to hear directly from the participants that they work with. In the words of an NGO member that we collaborated with, as the donor or person sitting back here in HQ, that's what you want, real life happening and not just a written report. So we see that PV is used by these NGOs to understand the impact of their programs on communities, and especially when they're trying to work with them long term. Feedback given directly by communities is often seen as being more credible and more real for donors and other stakeholders within the organization. In this study, we argue that current PV practice is very much rooted in the digital media landscape that existed in the 1980s. This is, after all, when PV first started gaining mainstream attention. The modern digital media landscape is unrecognizable from that time. According to Global Web Index, 92% of internet users today watch videos online each month. And that's roughly 4 billion people in early 2019. Web 2.0 has seen the proliferation of social media and the shift from media being broadcast by a few experts to user-generated distribution and consumption of content. And yet, the practices of supporting PV have essentially remained unchanged. Current PV practice is still concerned with bringing camcorders into rural communities to help them tell their stories on film. However, this approach has a few problems. Smartphones are no longer a rare phenomena, and as such, many populations have existing technologies and have built up media literacy that can be leveraged without bringing in specialist equipment from outside. And the traditional way of doing PV is too expensive for many NGOs to utilize in their projects, and that's why PV is being left out of many NGO practices due to its inaccessibility. This study is our vision of what PV could look like when brought into conversation with modern technologies, trends, and practices in digital media. Now, researchers have discussed the challenges associated with using PV before, and they've talked about the problems associated with using PV as a medium to engage participants. In Manuel Atal's work, PV was used to facilitate the capture of citizen stories towards a local neighborhood planning process they found that participants used PV to shed light on previously hidden narratives, which highlighted elements that usually get lost behind when participatory processes rush towards a predefined output. And in our own prior work, we discussed the use of PV approaches that could use advancements in mobile technologies, and we noted that barriers to entry for video work could be significantly reduced. So building on that, in this study, we examine the constraints faced by NGOs who use PV, and we offer some insights on how PV can be reinvigorated to better support NGO and community needs. Over the last few years, we collaborated with the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, better known as the IFRC, to conduct monitoring and evaluation. This is where NGOs check on the progress of their projects in the field, known as MNE using PV to engage rural communities in the feedback process. IFRC are the world's largest development association, and they have members based in over 190 countries around the world. They are key actors in both short-term and longer-term development interventions. We spoke with their staff from this movement, who are based around the world in different regions, and they do community feedback and engagement activities. So. 
We conducted interviews with 16 experienced practitioners. And the aim of these interviews was to understand their perceptions and experiences of the use of PV in humanitarian and development work. Semi-structured interviews were conducted and recorded via Zoom. Our participants suggested a number of challenges with their community feedback process that could be better supported with modern media practice. For example, many participants identified opportunities for ongoing and continuous use of video within their roles. The hiring external consultants for doing PV is a very expensive process and we found that it was beyond the budget of many local chapters. Some said that it costs as much as 100,000 US dollars for some types of projects. Unsurprisingly, many organizations were not able to justify the costly approaches that were involved in doing PV. Another consideration is that communities expect to be partners in the decision-making process of development, and they want to be more involved and consulted rather than just being seen as passive recipients. We can argue then that existing PV approaches that are being carried out by external consultants coming in for a short period and producing community video is carried out against the spirit of development ideals. So now that we have taken a look at some characteristics of PV in the field, we're going to look at some modern media practices. We have picked object-based media or OBM as a lens to critique PV practice because it has certain properties that we believe are useful in this conversation. First, it helps remove some workflow assumptions. OPM removes many of the assumptions of traditional linear production workflows, which rely on the unidirectional transfer of video content from one process to the next. Also, object-based media considers all content to be equal. Through the application of rich metadata, content is shaped and distributed rather than through destructive processes of cutting and chopping. It's also reconfigurable. Individual elements of video can be repackaged in myriad forms based on any number of factors, for example, personal preference, contextual relevance, or the languages required by the viewer or the listener. So we present PV 2.0, a new vision of PV based on these practices, reflecting on the current challenges mentioned in the findings above. The traditional PV pipeline assumes roles such as presenters, producers, editors, and consumers. Yet, there could be tremendous value if these distinctions are removed when working with communities. This is particularly true in the context of reflective or longitudinal use of PV. What if facilitators put more focus on increasing media literacy of the communities they work with? This would enable the community to regularly input and be a valuable resource in generating content for the NGO. And this makes long-term community video work feasible for NGOs who currently are not able to do so through expensive short-term projects. Redefining the PV process in terms of reconfigurable objects forces further reflection on the role of the editorial and post-production processes that are normally associated with PV, thus opening new opportunities. In PV 2.0, the reliance on a linear production pipeline is replaced with a flexible interpretation of narrative consumption. This allows communities to produce content that can be consumed by multiple stakeholders, for example, through an interactive documentary format, whilst maintaining editorial and narrative control over the content. However, mechanisms for facilitating the new types of narrative of such formats do not exist yet. Such processes will need to support co-production and a continual feedback loops between facilitators, community, and audience. By the same time, will allow for rich dialogue between the community and external audiences. Present-day commissioners of PV recognize the rich value of video as data and expect to utilize these videos in ways never envisioned by original pioneers of PV. As our findings demonstrate, the resource-intensive nature of PV production methods forces organizations into using the output for many purposes and audiences, for example, with their donors, headquarters staff, or government agencies. PV 2.0 configures the production process to ask different questions of the community in order to create video data that is more suitable for use as part of data triangulation.
In this study, we have seen that PB 2.0 can configure the video production process to ask different questions to the community of video creation. This will allow organizations and communities to work together to produce content that the communities can be in control of and it's more useful to the organization. To conclude, PB needs to adapt to unleash its potential for enabling communities to be more active agents in the development space. Thank you.